Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, give it a couple seconds as uh, people sign on, but thanks for joining the webinar. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, people are starting to file in now. All right, cool. Well, we're recording, and uh, I'm I'm the introduction, but I'm also the least interesting part of the the presentation. So I can I can start us off, uh, get that over with while uh, while everybody joins on here. Um, as I as I said, thanks everybody. For joining, um, it's great to to see a, a good list of people attending. Uh, it'll lead to a, a good discussion. So, the topic that we're discussing today is navigating employee data privacy uh, in the context of our facilities and how we can um, make use of some of that information to make people's lives easier um, and uh, and deliver efficient services throughout. So um, just quick overview, pretty loose agenda today. Uh, I'm going to make a quick introduction on why we might want to use employee data, um, talk a bit about some of the obligations we have working with that information. Uh, and then we've brought Paul. Uh, Paul uh, is going to talk to us about finding the balance and some success that he had um, balancing those two things. And at that point, we're gonna open things up to a discussion ask each other some questions. Uh, anybody is, is welcome to participate, give their insight, their experience with working with this, this type of information. So um, we'll be about 10 minutes of kind of introduction between myself and Paul, and then we can open the floor to the, the forum. So talking about why we might use employee data. Um, there are probably some cases off the top of your head where you can think of where that data might be useful for particular business functions, particular roles, but also for the general population um, at your facilities. Um, the facilities team often holds or at least touches some of this data, a lot of this data, and can provide tools that can work with the data. Uh, things that we see commonly are being able to quickly reach out to another employee if you're working on some services for them, um, being able to clarify and, and contact them quickly that way, maybe through an app or something like that. Uh, a pretty obvious one is being able to locate a friend, uh, whether you're in a fully hybrid environment, you don't necessarily know where somebody's sitting day to day, or you're um, working remotely in a different office potentially and, and wanting to, to meet with someone and get some directions to, to find them there. Another case that we're seeing more and more uh, lately as people are allowing visits and things like that is being able to, a visitor to a facility being able to find the, the host that they're working with rather than waiting for the host to come find them. So there's some use cases there to leverage some of the information that we have tied to our employees. Um, but we do have some responsibilities, some obligations. Hopefully I'm not stressing anybody out too much by showing this, um, but we, we all know that uh, we do have responsibilities. There are regulations that come from different levels of government, federal um, and and uh, provincial municipal uh, regulations. We also have organizational rules that are in place at our organization, whether it's to meet some industry standard or just based on a, a code that we have at our organization. And of course, we want to make sure that the employees feel comfortable with how their information is being used. We want that's part of a, a comfortable workplace is uh, that kind of trust with with the information. So uh, it ends up being a bit of a balancing act, right? We want to make sure that we're respecting privacy uh, as well as making the most of some of the usability that we can get um, from tools and, and some of the, the support that we have. So uh, we have some examples of, of some success. Paul has, uh, I think, a, a great story to talk to us about uh, how he found the, the balance for his group and what some of the feedback's been there. 
um, I just as a, a little a little joke there, I grabbed his uh, his GEDS profile there, talking about where some of that information is, where it can be useful to um, to anyone. So um, with that, I'll pass things off to to Paul, uh, who is uh, works in in facilities at CATSA, and Paul uh, can tell us about his success with balancing uh, usability with privacy. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, uh, the GEDS information there uh, you had was uh, basically apparently our solution to the problem, and I'll I'll talk about what happened. Um, essentially, when we started getting uh, Archibus and going through the database and what was going to be required, of course, uh, privacy concerns uh, did come up. And the uh, slide that you had before uh, with the, the 11 identifiers, uh, we had three in, in three specifics uh, that were kind of of concern. Uh, one of them was, of course, the consent of like, oh, my information is going to be viewed by uh, potentially all of the organization. So um, there was some concern of like, how do we get consent? And one of those issues was uh, uh, the realization that when everyone starts up their computer, uh, everyone already basically agrees that like what you're doing on your computer is business related and like things are already um, uh, under the assumption that people within your workplace are going to be um, seeing your phone number and your email address. So you, the consent has, was already essentially in uh, uh, place uh, for our team. But then, of course, there was the, the limiting of use and individual access uh, from a overall standpoint. And that's uh, those couple of items were covered under the user roles and um, properly assigning those to employees who were hoteling. So we use the majority of our system for hoteling. And uh, we had uh, previously a lot of individual data within the system. And that was a major concern from our own ATIP team who was looking at you know, privacy issues and concerns. And they realized that, uh, as an example there, I've got like my data, well, not my date of birth, but an example of my date of birth and like shoe size and uh, the color of my eyes. Um, those aren't really required when you need uh, uh, the information. And so um, the level of concern that they had was employee identification and uh, specific levels. And our concerns there was for some reason, we had levels which pertain to um, uh, salary and that shouldn't be in there. And the employee identification that we had was specifically linked to the employee, our employee numbers. And uh, our privacy team really felt that that shouldn't be readily available either. So we had to come up with different uh, ways to either use that information and how to like uh, apply it within Archibus. And one of the challenges was that uh, the employee ID field is literally the key attribute there, and uh, we were able to find a, uh, uh, another number or words that were able to be used uh, that uh, the whole company used that wasn't specific or um, uh, for each individual. And so it allowed us to then create the system so that each uh, uh, field and individual can be found appropriately. And then we eliminated things. So no longer my shoe size is no longer in Archibus, but um, what we needed to figure out was like, what is already commonly available to then put into the system that won't uh, cause issues with the privacy uh, challenges. And GEDS was literally that. And so we've tried to figure out like, well, how can we get the information from GEDS into Archibus? And then working with John, we figured out a way that we can link literally our, our Active Directory, which feeds GEDS, into Archibus. So we were then able to clear out all of the information that was deemed uh, an issue or a challenge uh, within Archibus and then populate it with already common available um, items uh, and fields that were basically already public knowledge. So if you had it on your business card or in GEDS, 
it would then be easily and readily available in Archibus. So uh, we used that as our guide and how to populate the information. So now uh, when people search within Archibus, it's, uh, they're seeing the same information uh, that uh, they see from GEDS. So we basically eliminated any major privacy issues within Archibus just by using uh, at GEDS. Uh, there was a couple of um, changes that we had to make because we did affect the employee ID uh, field, which is a key attribute across uh, all of Archibus, a very important field. Uh, but working with John and uh, the Horizon team, we were able to find uh, a way to link uh, employee names and their first names and last names appropriately within the system so that different of views can be made. And so um, things are very user friendly and very, very privacy because um, are very private because of the user roles that we've now also limited anyone's view that can um, be accessed by an employee. They end up don't seeing anything. And because we went the full route of removing any possibility of privacy issues within the system, even if we accidentally give somebody uh, larger powers within the user roles, um, they don't see any major privacy. Uh, a privacy breach basically does not happen because there is not enough privacy information within the system anymore. So we eliminated that by uh, uh, controlling the information in the data system. And as uh, I learned from John um, and from my own data team, data is only as good as what can be uh, updated and valid. So we just limit that. Um, and that makes life a lot easier for a lot of people. Uh, and as we move forward, uh, I'm already in place working with Horizon to make some uh, more changes to uh, uh, their quality of life when using the hoteling system. So Nick, if you can just uh, flip to the next page, uh, you'll see an example of uh, a floor that we have and um, some quality of life things that we've done and we're adding to the system. So one of them was to ensure uh, our floor plans were clean and simple. Uh, we had a lot more uh, chairs and um, uh, occasional seating in our floor plans but what it did was it just created clutter and so we removed that from the drawings so that it was a clean and concise image and reduced any complications i also um we started using uh polylines within the drawings so that we can create uh, different types of symbols and so uh, on the floor plan there you can see the letters sc uh, that represent something within our system uh, as a visual ability to know right off the bat that those are uh, amenities that can be selected, but it's just the visual representation that assists the drop down menu that is available on the one side. Um, we also had uh, many guests come in to use our bookings, um, so that's wonderful. Uh, but another aspect that we also had challenges on were uh, maintenance. Um, we were previously just taking workstations offline and we were having issues with uh, people who had already made reservations and what to do about that and the the the, the time frame in which reservations could be made uh, so when you take them off they're not available for literally those three weeks and so we we created a guest uh, a service uh, a name essentially so that we can uh, book and and do maintenance on on those hoteling stations without taking them offline for an extended period of time. And uh, one of the key things that we also learned was to have uh, less amenities within our, our booking system so that it wasn't uh, nearly as uh, complicated. Less is more is what they say from a design perspective. Uh, but those are just uh, some quality of life things that we learned as uh, more users uh, began using the system. And that's Thanks, uh, Paul. Yeah, that's uh, I think a great um, a great kind of balance that that you struck. I think um, it uh, looks like you've been able to find a, a sweet spot, and it's it's neat to see that there's 
um, some additional pieces that uh, so some ongoing improvements that you're looking at um, implementing. So uh, cool stuff there. And thanks for sharing that with us. I know that, you know, privacy is a common question for for everybody so what i wanted to to do now is actually kind of open up the floor for the the user forum portion of this um and i you know it says questions up there um <laughs> this isn't necessarily grilling paul of course you have uh questions for paul you can you can ask them uh, if you have comments about you know things you see that um maybe you've done a little bit differently that's great too um so we can kind of discuss how you're balancing privacy, what usability features you've found and how you've uh, been able to implement those um, and maybe next steps that, uh, that each of you might be taking and where that might be leading you. So um, mechanically speaking, uh, everybody did come in muted and I don't believe you're able to unmute yourself. So if you can raise your hand or uh, I, I believe that's gonna be the, uh, the easiest way to tackle that. Ian can unmute you to ask a question. Uh, if you don't feel like um, speaking, you can also type a question into the, the Q&A section as well. Is that right, Ian? Yep, that's right. We already have one up here. It's, uh, it's for Paul asking, which amenities stayed and which made the cut during your work? Oh, good question. Uh, so we had uh, gone with the idea of uh, originally more information was better. So we had like whiteboards, um, uh, chair sizes, and uh, we went into too much detail. So what we did was we informed uh, the company of what a standard workspace would have, and then went with things that didn't it this space didn't have or titles that the space might be. So for example, we have uh, a quiet space, basically a definition of a, a, a clear button that instead of a searchable, we we made it a, a, a visible thing. All of our hoteling stations are sit stands. So instead of having that a, uh, a as an amenity, we actually removed it because it's our standard. And now we've outlined places that aren't uh, sit stands so that people would understand that when they do res reserve that location, uh, the standard is not being kept. So, um, and we removed the details that uh, every space has like different ergonomic chairs. So some have, um, what do you call them, uh, bar stool chairs. So we identified those uh, rather than just identifying everything. So we got to uh, basically, instead of identifying everything within the standard, we took the exception of what wasn't included, if that makes sense. Does. Okay, we have Amanda has her hand raised, so I'm going to unmute her. She says self muted there, so Amanda, I believe if you take yourself off mute now. Okay, can you, you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, I'm really uh, intrigued by your presentation. Thank you for sharing. Um, I had a question because we're going down the path of introducing amenities. Uh, for bookings. And I had a question for your end users based on the experience. Did you find that you were, they were more engaged or it was more understood visualizing it as like blocks or polylines? Or do you find that the labeling is a better way to introduce it? Because I can see you did both. Did you find like one was better, especially for those who are not very accustomed to uh, floor plans and, and the tools themselves? Did you find one one is easier for people to understand versus the other? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the challenge was, yeah, um, we, we have both, like you said, because some are more uh, visual of reading the menu system versus the floor plans, but then there are others who want the visual cues. And that's why it was important for us to clean up the drawings as much as we can. The one thing that's lacking right now is that if you have visual cues, but you don't have a legend, it's hard for some users to understand what it means. So even though I have SC right there and then SC and uh, literally secret computer in the amenities, people don't make the link. And 
that's a bit of a challenge that I'm going through right now of how to properly display these visual things without a legend. I'm trying, I'm thinking of sneaking in a legend right on the floor plan, but if people zoom in at the wrong spot, it gets a little challenging, but it's just working your way through cleaning the drawings up so that the location and, and standard of whatever symbol you're using would be in a, a in the typical location so that they know it's not just a, a chair or a table, it's actually a symbol. Great, thank you. Sorry. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Like I said, if anybody else hasn't, if you have any questions or want to share your experience with what you've been doing or have questions for Paul, raise your hand. We can do the same thing. I know there's one sitting here where Paul, it says, obviously there was a great example of you sitting there and having starting simple and expanding based on your experience. Do you have any plans to go further than that with your, with your current configuration or at and make any additions? Uh, so yeah, we're actually probably going to be launching a lot of our satellite offices into the hoteling system, and that's going to bring a lot of new users, um, especially in our satellite offices. We have a lot of guests that come in, um, and I know uh, from a privacy standpoint that there was some concerns from our guests uh, on how they make reservations if they were coming in. And um, what I found out was that employees who have these guests coming in can input their name as guests. Uh, but the fun thing is that the guest information that you put into uh, the Archibus system, it doesn't actually put it in the back end. So the information isn't, from what I see, isn't kept. So uh, I guess that's good from a, a privacy perspective because I couldn't look up um, uh, within the database guests that have shown up, I would be able to see if the employee made a booking for a guest, but it would just have their name and none of the other information gets kept. So that I thought I thought that was super unique and neat. Um, but yeah, users uh, uh, in the regions are going to bring some different challenges because they have different spaces and, and uh, yeah, I look forward to doing that. Perfect. Thank you. And yeah, that's actually sorry. I was I, I just wanted to to jump in there because the guess is that was actually something that kind of interested me. Um, you know, I, I had uh, Paul, you and I had kind of talked about um, additional processes handling the guests. Um, and uh, is there do the guests themselves have any access to any of the information? Um, like I know we, you're kind of mostly talking about the guests information and um, there's retention rules around that and everything, but uh, do the guests themselves get any access to your internal information with the tool? No. So they, they, our system is, is based around only employees only. And so if a guest is required to have a hoteling, they would have to be, uh, they would have to book it through their uh, their counterpart or their uh, I guess their host uh, to right. to do that properly. They do not have access. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I I think that's you know uh, one of the things we mentioned was managing your your visitors um, and you know potentially widening the the breadth of that information again within playing within the rules. Um, that's something that we're seeing more and more we actually uh did a webinar recently on visitor management and um and how people are handling that so i was curious if um that was something you were considering or um anyone else as well um something that uh, that you're looking at for the future but um cool stuff there i, I like that that's definitely um we're, we're letting people back in so it's a cool thing to see how that's how that's getting done yeah, and honestly, with the simplicity of the system, I have received little to no complaints with how people, uh, with a host booking it for guests. And occasionally, I check in the back end just to see, like, oh, look, how how is my reservation program going? How is Archibus going? And it's always neat to see the, these random guests in seats. And it's like, oh, that's neat. That's nice to know that people are doing this without any issue. And that's been, I, I guess, uh, for me 
as a as a as a user as a special user uh this has been a very pleasant experience because i haven't had a lot of user issues um from we've been using this program for almost two years now so it's been really nice that it's been almost hands-free uh because it just does what it needs to do and it's been fantastic for me so far we have another question come in from john so are you using any check-in processes and john also after this quest after the answer if you want to if you want me to unmute you and raise i can you can raise your hand you can actually get to and you actually have a discussion with paul but yeah are you are you using any check-in processes right now paul with your uh current configuration Wow, that's a that's a great question. Uh, we're in the process of deliberating about it. Uh, the issue is people book places and then they don't come in. It's a uh, it's that simple. And check in would basically uh, solve that problem. Uh, but it's another step that users would have to do. And they've been so trained to actually use the system right now that adding uh, another step is a little bit of our concern and i'm literally working with uh, archibus uh right now or with high horizon uh to try and figure out what kind of other solutions there may be uh or how the check-in process works specifically um so that we haven't implemented it yet as there's some concerns of like basically retraining everyone um but it's really a simple process from what i understand perfect and john's got yeah. his hand raised so i'm just going to go ahead and unmute you john there you go. You should be able to talk now. We can hear you. Hi. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Um, yeah, we're we're in the process of of upgrading uh, our archibus, and um, check in is is one of those things. A, a lot of our a lot of our current users um, are asking <clears throat> about those desks that seem to be empty when they get there. And how come that hotelable desk that I couldn't book has nobody sitting at it? So um, I, I guess the, the the big thing that we see there is um, with the check-in process, it's it's nice because it can help alleviate that problem. But uh, I guess the big question is what's stopping that user from sitting at home uh, working remotely and saying, oh, yeah, here's the notification. Yes, I'm at my desk, even though I'm not there. You know, it, it, is, there a, <clears throat> is there a way or something that's coming um, in the future that, that maybe um, with a, a QR code scan or something like that, that a user can say, yes, I'm actually at the desk I, and, and not just responding to my email notification? Um, that's something that we would like to see, but uh, I'm curious to what your thoughts on, on where you're going with the with the check-in. So uh, we're again, like I mentioned, we're we're hesitating on it now. For your particular challenge, I know that there are other systems out there uh, from like motion sensors or like actually, like you said, like a QR code that could be done. Uh, but I don't know if they're particularly uh, connectable to Horizon. I'm sure that they have all sorts of plugins that uh, could make this possible. Um, I think it's also an education thing. So we've uh, we've started that education process of posting on our internal website of reminding individuals that if you're not coming in to actually uh, uh, cancel your reservation and remind people on how to do that process. Um, and we're literally seeing how that goes. Yeah, and I'll I'll jump jump in there and say uh, to your question, Paul. Yeah, there's there's tons of options for uh, validating whether it be like you mentioned sensors um, or other ways, you know, like the QR codes um, or you know restrictions on where you can check in from um there's a bunch of different ways we've tackled that uh, it's it's uh, a fun con conversation to have really because there's a, a spectrum of you know what degree of information is useful for you um what degree similar to the privacy with data conversation what degree is too invasive for the employees um and where that balances and it's different for every organization so it's actually a really cool i mean paul you're 
I'm, I'm, I might be boring you because you're having that conversation right now. Um, but definitely everybody has their, their position on that spectrum. And that's, uh, there's lots of options we have to, to help suit that. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in one last time that another problem that John might be having is um, uh, with back to work uh, occurring, uh, a lot of people are having like on-site meetings. So what ends up happening, especially on my side, is that people come in and they book very popular locations and offices because they love the location, and then they go off to meetings for the entire day. So they've booked an office, but aren't even in the office because they're in a meeting down the hall. And so they're... There's again a, a, an education that like maybe if you're just coming in for that, don't use the bookable hoteling spaces. Use the other touchdown spaces that we've created so that you don't have a space or, or book that popular spot. We have several offices that people just love and, and book it on a regular basis because of habit. And it's just that's again, it's all learning as we move to how people use this system. Um, it's not a fun challenge to have, John. I know it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Wayne's actually got his hand up. We're going to unmute Wayne. And then Amanda, we're going to get to you right after. I see your hand's been raised for a couple of minutes there. There you go, Wayne. You it's should be great good. Yeah, it's a great conversation. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of things that Paul said and then what Nick said. The, uh, the first part is, Paul, you're right about the policy or, or procedures balanced with the technology. So there has to be both. And that's, that's great that you have that. And I think that's what a lot of clients uh, miss out on initially is that policy procedure conversation so people know what the guidelines are. And then picking up on what Nick is talking about, there's obviously things that can be done as people enter a building. So you can have integration with badge swipe. You can have uh, IP address integration. We see that with clients. You can have uh, the QR codes or whatever at the desks so that they can scan their check-in. And then you can go into sensor technology that either sits in your ceiling or under the desk or, or counts people coming in and out. It goes back to another point that Paul made, which is this idea of, um, are you looking to have all of your spaces bookable? Or are you finding a balance between bookable space and non-bookable? So the people who come in and hang their coat on the back of a chair, don't have to book a space because they're going into a meeting room. Um, so there's available space for them to to kind of come and settle in on. Uh, and it, it goes also to your metrics of what you're trying to count. Are you trying to count that you have, uh, you know who's in, or are you trying to count that you have 50 people in a space that can accommodate 70? So you, you can see in all of that conversation, you can balance privacy and you can balance the different measures that you're gonna try and drive where you might say, I have 50 people showing up in the space for 70. It means I can probably add another 50 people and not max out that space. So that's, again, it, it all drives out the metrics and different things you go, but these are all things that clients have either done or accommodated for kind of in this group and outside of this group so it's really uh, great to hear the questions and and hopefully people can jump in and kind of say, oh yeah, we 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 took this approach uh, and that's how we solved it. So that's kind of, you know, Paul, thanks for doing that and kind of kicking that uh, kicking that whole thing off. That's it. All right, perfect. Thank you, Wayne. All right, Amanda, now you're up. I know he's been waiting a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to um, offer a couple of I guess, suggestions of what we've done. So we're ramping up, our organization's ramping up to bring staff back to the office um, at a 50% capacity as of July 1st. And so some of the things that we've done outside of um, the booking tools um, is to enable day, day lockers, RFID enabled day lockers to support staff where they can put places, put their stuff in places so that they're not booking a desk so they have somewhere to dump their stuff. So just offering that maybe as a suggestion for anyone else that's maybe struggling with that, having kind of the no show, somebody booked a desk but doesn't actually sit at the desk all day, that's a suggestion. 
Um, but I actually wanted to ask, I think it was, um, I think it was Paul that had said it, but it, perhaps I'm wrong. Um, how do you deal with conflicts? So we don't have a lot of them happening right now, but uh, we anticipate as we move back to a, a higher number of days per week in the office that we're going to have a lot of people show up and just sort of plunk themselves down wherever they see fit, even though the desk might have already been booked. So I'm just kind of canvassing the crowd to ask how they may have perhaps dealt with conflict and how to sort of resolve that or address that. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll start that by how we did it was again it came down to uh, policy procedure and just like uh, information of letting people know that technically a booking will supersede anybody that plunks down, but we also uh, previously made sure that um, the plunk down areas or the non-bookable spaces or the touchdown spaces, if you will. Uh, were easily noticeable and identifiable on site so that uh, users who are just coming in and didn't use the system or or in the odd case who refused to use the system because some people are like that um, they have somewhere to go and uh, visual representation on the floor helps uh, with that we used uh, literally like foam core signage for a while like the yellow signs that literally said go over there um, but better signage is definitely going to be better. I think that, but that helps. Um, if it actually happens, I mean, uh, when it did happen when, in the beginning, uh, people were really accepting of it. It's like, oh, I didn't know you booked it. My apologies. And then they get up and they go around. And then afterwards, they they may be frustrated because they can't find an office along the window. And but that's what happens. We we stress the first come first serve uh, a portion and. Uh, management backs us up, so it's 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 helpful in that world. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm not seeing any more hands raised. If you have any more questions or want to contribute to what your department, what your organization has been doing, of course, raise your hand. We can get you on mute. We can get you out there. But we're not seeing anything else right now. Um, I know that. There is actually there's one more question sitting in there. Is there a plan to add a find a colleague pictures of employees on the on at any point for the booking systems? I know they're not in GEDS, but it's I it guess that it would be excluded information for the time being. But I know that would probably be a very useful uh, addition to the platform. I know it's available. We're not currently doing it. Um uh simply because i found out that like i can put in my own photos so i had like a photo of myself eating some ice cream at one point and i'm like maybe that's not as professional as what it should be and then when i brought it to management they started asking well like oh well how do we get the photos of all of these individuals and make sure um they're one professional and two they get loaded appropriately and so it's a it's a little bit of a um a challenge because you need to actually like get good photos who's going to do it and schedule it all and then load it all into the system while that part isn't hard it's actually just getting all the photos uh is there going to be an update schedule so it's uh we're a smaller team so it comes down to again how much data and what can we put in and manage to ensure that it's valid on a regular basis and that, unfortunately, right now is just not up on top of the list. Yeah, that that's the ice cream picture. I think if everyone else does it, I think can there be a good bit on smaller team, get everybody with their ice cream on their pictures so that it can be. Jerry, I see you have your hand up, so I'm going to unmute you. And you should be good to go whenever you self, when you unmute on your end, we'll be able to hear you. Perfect. Unmuted. Much to everybody's horror. <laughs> Thanks for uh, thanks for taking my question. This is just a, a small curiosity thing, actually going back to Amanda's comment, complete curiosity, lateral thinking thing. What was the, uh, you mentioned 50% um, capacity, bringing people back in in July, adding um, lockers, which would maybe be attributes of things that could be looked at as part of your whole big picture. But you mentioned RFID. Um, I was just curious what the RFID tie-in was there. Maybe not completely germane to the conversation here, Nick, but but I was just curious what that what part of the solution that pretended, Amanda. 
Um, so the RFIDs are being used to open and, and lock the lockers. So that's how we're checking checking the lockers th through an RFID on our security badges. Ah, okay, very cool. Thanks, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, no uh, problem. And, and thanks for the presentation, guys, very helpful. Thank you both. I know there's one point that I'm aware of where if you have a you have, have a floor display, then Amanda, I know to your point as well as to anyone else who's experiencing the people who aren't showing up versus are showing up. If you have a floor display, it helps you see who's showing up and showing the available spaces. So that's one of the things where if you're seeing a real time, you can see who's showing up, who's showing up where, and then you can see what instead of just seeing what is versus isn't booked, you can actually see or just who's sitting down. I know it's one very useful part, useful part of it, especially with the floor display, the heat maps and everything. And then that displays over time where, where people are going, where it's more frequency, of course, as well. Of course, if you're a frequent user of the program, you're already gonna know that. That's actually a, a, a cool thought, Ian, uh, as, you're, as you're saying that, I was kind of thinking back to um, the idea about uh, you know, the, the booked but abandoned desks and, and to Paul's point about a smaller team, depending on you know your team size, your team dynamic, um, something like that with uh, that adds a little accountability amongst the team um, can often help reinforce. Um, you know, if it's not just the boss looking at whether or not you actually use the seat you're booking, if if the, your buddy who wanted that seat is seeing it, um, that that can uh, be a bit of incentive too. All right, Amanda. Ready to go? Um, actually, it's it's a question about uh, one of the asks that's come our way, and I just kind of when you guys started talking about that, piqued my curiosity whether or not there's something in the new version to support um, the management. So if they want to see um, what days their staff are in the office and where, do you know if there's already a reporting tool like a real like a heat map, like you were saying, or a floor visual that we would be able to leverage in the newer version? There is. I can answer that. It's yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a heat map um, built out primarily around um, kind of confirmed booking information. Um, so it, you know, the the extreme case is sensors tracking where people are at, um, but it can be connected to you know legitimate check-ins. Um, it could be connected to to bookings. Um, booking lists are available. Um, I believe. If I'm thinking back, I believe in your version already, but that heat map view has been added um, to, to work with some of that data. So I know that on the workplace side, you can see like other, uh, your team, you can see sort of in a calendar type view on the workplace side. Do you know if there's anything like that on the web central side? Um, that's a good question. That I'd have to uh, I'd have to double check on. I believe it is. Uh, generally, there's there's not too much on the workplace side that you don't get as kind of a back office um, type view. Um, for sure, you can get the booking list, and if you want to filter it to your team, uh, you can you can get that as well. Okay. Thanks. Wayne, I see you sitting there patiently with your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that thread about. Um, a, a, the common thing that we hear from clients is the idea of somebody's booked and they don't show up. Uh, as part of the policy that goes out is it can include statements that say, you know, if you don't check in in some way, shape or form uh, the day of, that the, the desk that you booked will be released back into the booking pool, right? You can have, you can have the system automate the idea of the release if somebody hasn't checked in. We even had clients put into their policy that the the users check in online the day before, just confirming that they're gonna be coming in. And then that way they have an opportunity to release the desk before, you know, before 10 o'clock the next day where somebody might not actually come and use it. So there's all kinds of different layers in behind the scenes that can be automated to help with this whole idea of uh, of no shows because I, I, policy or not, you're inevitably going to have people who are not coming in for the desks or as been talked about here, coming in and putting their their lunch down at the desk and then going into a meeting room. So yeah, all good stuff.
Great. Thank you, Wayne. That's a good point, especially with what we're seeing with, like you said, it's going to be a rising problem. We're going to need some, some integration to allow that and being able to release the desk would, you'd think alleviate a lot of those problems. I, that as well as the RFID lockers, almost using that as a, if people are integrating that, almost using it as a kind of a benchmark for seeing who's coming in just to go into a meeting room or just going into a desk using some, a function like a locker as kind of like a, a key metric to see if your people are using just a locker and not booking a desk, then they're definitely just going into book a meeting. And I'm not seeing any more questions. So if we've exhausted everybody's discussion, discussion battery, or if, ever, or if we've got everything else, Nick or Paul, do you have any final, final remarks on it? Actually, if you don't. Thoughts? If you don't mind, I do actually have a question for Amanda uh, with regards to the lockers and the RFIDs. Uh, I'm just curious to know about the size of uh, your lockers. I have a problem with people not wanting to use them. Um, so I was wondering uh, what size you have and, and what kind of um, um, yeah use you're actually getting out of them. So I, I can't speak to the exact dimensions of them, um, but they are part of our um, system solution, I believe, through Technion. Um, they, they look to be about the size of a 36 inch wide um, by possibly about 18 inches tall. So it's a fair size, so like they're a fair size locker for a day locker and, and you have to have your contents removed by the end of day. Um, our security will go around and open them all at the end of the night. So if you leave your stuff in there, there's a good chance it might not be there when you get back tomorrow or, or a week later when you show up back to work. Um, we actually we actually installed the lockers um, prior to COVID. Uh, uh, we, we built a new building and it was um, the idea behind the building was to have more of an activity based solution. And so that was actually already built into the requirements for the project for that for that um, that new build. And so we've just sort of expanded on it. It was initially the pilot, and now we've moved it into our larger uh, buildings. We're still not at a very high uh, utilization rate at this point. I think we're somewhere in and around uh, 25 to 30 percent in office. So uh, they're not being used as much as they are probably going to be used come July when everybody is mandated back 50 percent. Uh, but we've already started to um, delegate out the RFIDs because we have to obviously we have to change all of our security badges to comply with the new uh, our requirements. So. We're in the process of doing that right now. So talk to me in six months. I'll let you know how, <laughs> how much use there is. <laughs> right? but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Still in the early stages. Uh, we're sort of feverishly getting everything ready, um, fitting out all of our all of our sites with, you know, single monitors or double monitors and making sure everybody has a docking station and a keyboard and all of that stuff. So We've got a lot of moving parts that are happening right now for our July 1st go live. So, well, good luck and thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna need a holiday come August. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I definitely did need my own when I finished our uh, location. All right. So, yeah, we can have a whole other user group just from you, Amanda, in six months. Then, John, I see your hands up. You have the floor. Uh, I just got a, a question for Nick with regards to to check in based on somebody's prior comment. Is the system capable of sending uh, a reminder to a user that they've booked a desk as as was indicated the day before, and then also uh, require them to do a check in uh, on the day of uh, of their booking? Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, that's all. Uh, parameterized, you can choose whether to send a reminder and how far ahead to send a reminder. Uh, and then you can also specify whether check-in is required and what time frame is uh, available for check-in before potentially it gets automatically canceled. Right. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, John. And then I've just got another question for the field. If anybody wants to pipe up, wants to speak up and answer, do you all have unassigned seatings, or there's some permanent spots allocated in your offices? I know, especially with the July 1st rollout of the mandate, 
um, for the federal government. They're having assigned seats versus permanent spots allocated if everybody has to come back on certain days, how that might look like in your organizations. I'll let, I'll let others chime in before I answer. <laughs> Amanda, you can start and then Paul, and Amanda and John, whichever, Amanda, you can go yeah. first. Sure. Um, we have about 10% in office permanent staff at this point already assigned that are blocked out. So, yeah, John, what about you guys? Um, we have a, a number of sites that um, have assigned seating. Uh, we have one site in particular, even though people do have an assigned desk, they are still required to book it uh, so that that desk can be made available when they're on vacation or out of the office. So that's our that's one of our one of our sites. That's their policy. That's a good idea, John. That's uh, we. Uh... We've suggested for our individuals who have assigned seating to keep their office unlocked when not in use or going on vacation, so their team members could use the space if and when required. Um, we also created a space uh, which we we called dedicated space, so it kind of acts like a uh, neighborhood, but not. Um, so it's a large space that basically is designated to a specific team for special use because of their unique parameters and, and requirements for, for working on the job. So we have literally one space that it's like, it's not a, an enclosed office, but it's like, I'd say like 300 square feet, um, but it holds the team of 20 individuals who comes in uh, in and out of the office to do their work. So it's like their own little neighborhood, but they don't need to book it because literally they, they just come in to do what they need to do. It's a very uh, network or IT focused area, but it's um, set up in a way that's specialized for their needs because um, uh, some of our IT team who needs apparently like, you know, 20 monitors, they need nine keyboards, like <laughs> sure, whatever floats their boat, but at least we've shrunk down this little space so that they can, uh, they can work. So it's not a, an assigned space, but it's like dedicated to a team. I feel I feel a little called out on the uh, 20 monitors there. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's a few. There's a couple people that come to mind when you think of that many. <laughs> Melanie, I see your hand is up. I'm gonna unmute you, and you can once you unmute on your end, then you're good to go. Oh, hey everyone. Uh, I just have a quick question. We have a, a requirement to uh, customize, I guess, because if it's not out of the box, uh, different a uh, period of time in advance that people can book their space in advance for different sites. Uh, just wanted to confirm this is not on a roadmap for uh, for Archibus so that we have to go ahead with the customization or not? I believe that one's for me. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, at the moment, uh, there's there's no um, expectation of that in like the next release. Um, so I would I would go with uh, what the the implementation crew are recommending. Um, generally, we across the board have a pretty good sense of that, but um, definitely something to uh, keep tabs on through through user voice and with um, your your account team as well, because we can always um, try and push those things forward in, in other avenues as well. Uh, just another quick question. Has anyone or how's everyone's uh, experience with the mobile solutions? Or does everybody always deploy, you know, the mobile solutions with the desktop solution? That's a good question, actually. And um, we get, um, I'd say, the the feedback is less obvious because the um the mobile solution for booking in particular is, is still it can be browser based people can still just use it on their phone they don't need an app necessarily paul do, does your crew do anything on their phone like do you know or does it matter honestly i haven't heard a lot of people who who use it um it's because i guess everyone's on their computer they just find it just way easier we have a, a quick link 
on our internal website, which is one click away that gets to the booking system. So access is really simple from their laptops or their desktops. Uh, so I haven't heard a lot uh, from the mobile uh, world. Cool, yeah, that makes sense. Um, who was, uh, John was asking about QR codes. I don't think uh, you had them yet. Is anyone um, using the, the phones for QR codes as well? Amanda, go ahead. Uh, not to answer that one, I, I I would like to use the QR codes, Nick. I was gonna say we are a couple, a couple. I say a couple. We're several ver versions back. <laughs> I think we're at like 18 at this point now, uh, iteration. So, but upgrading this year, really excited about that. We actually use the workplace uh, URL and on our mobile phones because the majority of our staff have uh, region issued devices, and we do find that. There is an interest to use it um, remotely, and uh, we just created a, a, a policy with our security team to push, basically, for lack of a better term, an icon to everybody's uh, iPhones, and it's just the URL link, and we find that a lot of people are quite content with doing that. Uh, we're looking forward to the actual native app when we get to uh, the upgrade, but we we have found that it's been very successful, uh, and it's so easy to use that we you know we haven't had a lot of trouble with our staff using the tools thus far through the mobile or web based. Sorry. Thanks, Amanda. That's uh, that's cool to hear. Yeah, that's awesome. I know we've got only a few minutes left, so we're gonna wrap it up. I know our net we're trying to do do these every couple two to three months so so just to end off if anybody has any suggestions on what they want to see the next one about the next one be about and any thing any use cases that you guys are experiencing in your organizations that you want to get everybody together again talk about it feel free to once you raise your hand put it in the chat ask a question and we can make sure to see if, see what we can do in building out this next user group around something you guys are all seeing and just to add to that, Paul was uh, was really great that he uh, that he came with a solution. But um, these are awesome places to come with, you know, uh, how do I accomplish this as well, and and have the kind of discussion that we we've ended up having, right? Where uh, people have maybe goals that they're looking to achieve and want to um, field some questions out. So um, that's uh, don't feel like you need to have all the answers, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, Amanda, go ahead. Sorry, I'm like a million questions today. That's okay. Um, how, well, we won't. Uh, first question is, how often are we going to do the sessions and are they going to be module specific or are you open to any questions across the entire suite of modules? Right now we're looking at every two to three months, we say quarterly-ish. So depending on how many questions we're seeing but or how much interest, but they can be module focused, but obviously with the discussion, if it ends up going on a tangent, if it takes a little bit of a right turn, that's okay because maybe that right turn, everybody else will have this questions that we might not have gotten to originally. Hi, Jerry. Hey, um, <laughs> was just talking to one of our uh, sysadmins, uh, Julie, uh, who's quite a guru in the system. Nick, I think you know her. Um, and we were just talking about um, uh, on-site. And so just wanted to throw that out there for uh, potential uh, future session, um, having some on-site discussion, people's uh, experience, uh, et cetera, with it, as you guys are uh, considering subject matter for the future. Thanks, guys. Great idea. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll make a note of that one, definitely. Cause we, uh, I know I said we can do it every two to three months. It's also as much as you guys want. So if there's if we're seeing a lot of interest, then we can definitely do them more frequently. Because obviously we're all getting a lot of out of this. Hi Shirley, you are unmuted on our end. You're still muted on your, yeah. There you go. Hi, uh, I have a question because our company using the uh, Archibald Six is quite the no. Uh, quite behind to a version. So we are thinking about whether we need to upgrade to the most updated version or we uh, go to the SaaS solution. So I want to hear other user groups, is that uh, any experience can be shared about uh, when they move to a cloud solutions, how do they deal with those uh, historical customization things? Do they still want to bring some of the things forward or can they totally leave it uh, out of box solution? 
So it will be a dramatic change if we go through a heavily customization solution to a fully uh, out of box. So we want to hear about some other people's success story to help us to make the decisions. That'd be a cool, I think that'd be a great uh, user group topic. I think we've got um, a number of uh, people who could speak to that. I'm not sure how many we have on the call uh, right now who have made that transition, um, but we definitely have a good group of, of people who have looked into that and um, both, both sides of the decision as well. Uh, so I think that would be an awesome topic. Thank you. Right, and with that, we are at 1.30, so we believe we've hit time. Everybody else, I know everybody probably has places to be after this. Like we said, if you guys have any more suggestions on the next module you wanna do, next user group topic, send them to the in info at horizonsolutions.com, direct them to your account, to one of the account managers, or myself or Nick, it'll get, it'll get to me and Nick, and we can set up the next one and make sure to get your, make sure to get your questions answered and, and build out the next session around some whatever you guys want to see so i'm that's all from me nick if you have a little outro i could play some outro music for if you want but other than that i think we're good oh now i want to hear what uh, what you think my exit music would be oh, i'm happy thanks uh, thanks very much paul as well really appreciate you uh, getting the conversation started and and sharing your success and it was a pleasure for organizing and thanks everyone for pitching in all right thank you and we'll see everybody next time take care